Hi, everybody. Thank you for making the trek out to the Fenway Room, and thank you to everybody who's dialed in on the phone. Or I guess this is the garden room now, not the Fenway Room. But um, so if you don't know me, my name is Ann Geilinger. I'm part of the Tech Diversity Working Group. And as a part of this group, we bring in some external speakers to talk about issues that are related to being an underrepresented person in tech or just different technical topics that we might not experience here at Athena. So for this series, we've brought in Tanya Riley. She is a developer at Squarespace. Um, and she, fun fact, loves trains. Took the train down from New York City to come to this yesterday. So she had the best time of her life. <laughs> <laughs> and she is going to be talking about being glue. So I'll let her introduce that. Hi. So um, I, I want to open with a question. Um, who here has seen a project launch where every single person involved just did exactly their job? It doesn't work, right? And who has seen a project where everybody really seemed to be doing their job, but the project just wasn't launching? Um, I've seen a lot of that, and I want to talk about glue. So hello, my name is Tanya, and I'm a principal software engineer at Squarespace, um, before that I was at Google for longer than some people have been alive. Um, here's a strange thing about my job, though. Um, Although my, title, my job title is software engineer, I wrote basically no code last quarter. Um, in fact, I wrote four lines of code, and they were really awful, um, but I'm really proud of them. So I'm willing to show you what they are. Brace yourself. If you're a software engineer, this is really upsetting. It was a talk for our interns, and I wanted to show them how overcomplicated code could be a hazard to navigation. So I mean, look, look at this. Isn't this the worst? This is like, does it do a thing on valid input? We have no idea. No one will ever know. It's not possible to tell. And this is genuinely all the code I wrote at work last quarter. It wasn't even a pull request. It was in a talk. Um, and you might think from this that I hate coding. But actually, the opposite is true. I love coding. It's one of my favorite things to do. I find it really relaxing, really fun. But most of the time, I do it in my free time, or to make little stupid games to entertain my kid. Um, it took like 10 years in the industry before I started to love code. And now it's just, it's just like I just really enjoy it. But at work, it's not the best use of my time. Instead, I do a lot of what I call glue. Glue, glue work means doing whatever it takes to make the thing work, to make the team or the organization be successful. It's noticing the gaps and filling it. It's maintaining the big picture of the architecture and looking at new projects coming along, saying, wait, does that actually fit, or is it duplicating? And is it going in the same direction as everything else? And adding processes where they'll make people's lives easier. And for me, that means lots and lots of writing and reviewing documents, lots of design review, lots of whiteboard conversations, and really a ridiculous number of meetings, um, but not much time to code. Um, but because I have a job title that says I have technical credibility, that's safe. My title's principal software engineer, so people assume out of the gate that I can code. And I can, just for the record. Um, but suppose I did exactly the same work. Like my day to day was exactly the same. And I didn't have this badge on LinkedIn to say, you should take me seriously for, as a, a software engineer. It could be really career limiting. And I've seen this happen a bunch of times. So today, I want to talk about glue. Um, so here's our agenda. I'm going to tell the story of someone who was career limited by being, being glue, whose career was hurt by it. This is not a true story. It was originally an amalgam of about 10 true stories. And then since I gave this talk for the first time in June, um, enough people have told me their stories that it's now about 100 true stories. Um, we're going to vote on whether the outcome of the story was inherently unfair. I think it's, it's not like, really straightforward whether it was. I'm interested to get your take on it. We're going to talk about um, changing roles. Like when is the right time to become a people manager or a project manager or a product manager? Um, if you're coming from an engineering background. There are a ton of opinions on this on the internet, and I'm going to add one more. <laughs> and then um, we're going to talk about how to frame your work if you are doing a lot of glue, um, how to make sure your impact is visible, uh, or help your coworkers do the same thing if they're glue. And finally, I want to talk about how to keep learning and growing, because I don't feel like our industry admits that we learn things. We just act like knowledge comes to us in, in the night. Um, so OK, story time. Imagine a software engineer. Here she is. First day in a new team. She's been out of college a few years. She's had a couple of tech jobs before now. Um, she's not wildly confident in her skills, but she's doing fine, and she likes the work. She meets her new team. She meets a new code base. The code base is really hairy, and the first changes take a long time. Now, this is extremely normal, but everyone's busy with their own stuff, and no one is reassuring her. 
she feels like she's working too slowly, like she needs a lot of help, and she's starting to be afraid that they regret hiring her. After a few weeks, she's starting to think maybe no one would want to hire her. She doesn't feel like maybe she's cut out for this. But then she gets a win. She notices that on Slack, the internal customers of this team keep asking the same questions over and over again. And so she documents the answers, world changing. The customers are happier. The other engineers on the team are happier because they get fewer interrupts. It's, it's a win. OK, back to the difficult code. But pretty quickly, and she sees another place she can make a difference. A customer comes in with a request for something that the team's API should provide, really, but it doesn't yet. The team hasn't prioritized the feature yet. She spends a couple of days manually pulling the data, and the customer is so happy. Now, her main project is not any closer to being done, but a happy customer takes priority, right? I mean, it does, right? Over lunch one day, she talks to another team that her team is supposed to be working closely with and finds that they're kind of solving different problems. They have different ideas and they're going in different directions. So she sets up a meeting with the lead of that team and the system designer in her team. She asks a lot of questions. The thing changes direction. And now they're working together and building actually the right thing. She takes notes of the meeting, sends them around afterwards so that everyone has a shared memory and understanding of what got agreed. New people join the team. She remembers her horrible first few weeks and writes a bunch of onboarding documents. Welcome to our code base. Uh, and she sets up a mentorship program so everybody gets a mentor from now on. Outages keep getting attributed to lack of tests in the code. She gathers a bunch of senior people, basically locks them in a room for a couple of weeks until they come out with some coding standards. Everybody agrees on them. New code is more tested from now on. The coding standards also include style guides. New code is faster to review because uh, it's in a consistent style. Better code for everyone. Now, the manager has a bunch of other teams and is really busy. Uh, and is starting to rely on our friend here to know what's going on in this team. So the manager is like, hey, our ace coder over here seems blocked. Do you know what the deal is with that? So she investigates. And she discovers that this guy needs information from another team. But he doesn't love talking to the other humans. So he's put off talking to them to get the information he needs. And he's just kind of writing code in something adjacent, waiting for the information to come to him. She's not scared of talking to humans. So she goes and does that, understands the situation, brings back the data. He writes 5,000 lines of code. And because she now has a lot of state, she writes his launch documentation and you know, some user docs just to help the thing get out the door. It ships on time. Hooray, well done, Ace Coder, everybody says. Two years pass like this. Now, our engineer keeps vowing she will write more code soon. But every day, something more important comes up. This is a picture of my, this is genuinely a picture of my calendar. Um, when she has free time, it looks like this. It's an hour between meetings. The idea of swapping in code into your brain for one hour and then dropping it at the end, incredibly painful. But she's not worried about this, because she always gets good performance reviews. Everyone loves the work she does. The team is treating her kind of unofficially like a lead, because she has this big picture view. And she can review all of the designs and spot the negative space between them and point out what else needs to happen. She has one-on-ones with everyone. And she's mentoring basically every new person who's joined the company. She feels like she's gone up a level. I mean, think about where she was two years ago and where she is now. She's clearly gone up a level. Let's see if her company's promotion process agrees. Who should we promote? Well, obviously, the person who wrote all of the code and things shipped on time, and the person who did the design for the thing, and it made it integrate so well and solve the actual problem that we had. Well done, system designer. And that's it. She's like, wait, wait, what? Why not me? They're like, well, your project's not finished. You're not producing a lot of code. You didn't really have enough impact yet. She's like, but I decreased the onboarding time. I made us build the right thing. Our customers say I'm still the only person who helps them. I do the thing with the coding standards, you know, the outages we're not having now. Did you notice those? And I review all of our design docs. And the questions I ask make us build better things. They're like, yeah, that's great. That's very good communications work. What was your technical contribution? So she's like, what, wasn't, that te wasn't that technical? I mean, it wasn't code, but not all technical things are code. And they're like, look, you're great at communication. Your soft skills are outstanding. We just don't think you're really an engineer. Go be a project manager instead. So was it fair? I mean, she did good work. The project wouldn't have shipped without her. She was the glue that held the whole thing together. Over the last two years, she got really good at leadership, at coordination, and convincing people to work on the right thing. Um, she got better at some sort of harder to quantify technical stuff, like holding a big picture and understanding the needs for standards and adding processes and design review. But she legitimately didn't get at all better at coding. What do we do with this? Should she have been promoted? 
I don't think there's a right answer to this, but I'm really interested. Who thinks yes? Who thinks no? People are afraid to say no. I know some of you are thinking no. Because I don't think it's that straightforward. Who is extremely on the fence and conflicted? Like, I, I really am by this. Um, who, if, if you're, I, I know you haven't known me long, but who's willing to admit that you've been this engineer? Yeah, a few of us, yeah. One thing I'm certain of is that her manager owes her an apology here because there was a communications breakdown. This shouldn't have been a surprise. She was getting really good performance reviews, and she believed she was on the path to senior engineer. And you know, a lot of her work was representative of a senior engineer, or even a staff engineer. Like She's definitely got the leadership part covered here. If she had spent some more of her time doing really quantifiable technical work, it just wouldn't have been a question. Nobody would have argued. But her manager never had a conversation about that. Her manager never said, you were doing too much non-promotable work, not enough promotable work. And probably the manager was just glad that the work was getting done, because someone needed to do it. This glue work is the difference between a project that succeeds and one that fails. This is why um, TPMs, technical program managers, and project managers make such an impact. They do the ultimate glue role. They see the gaps, and they fill them, and they make the thing work. But in teams without project management, what happens? Well, in some teams, the manager or a team lead takes up the load. In others, the work gets spread among the people who are willing to do it or the people who are expected to do it. So I read this article. Um, it's on hbr.org. And there's this accompanying 35-page study, if you enjoy reading 35-page studies, about volunteering. It showed that when there's non-promotable work to do, women volunteer to do it 48% more than men. But they also found that men volunteered less because they knew that if they waited, the women would volunteer. If it was a room with no women in it, the men volunteered. The worst part was when manager, managers were asked to, to volunteer someone, to choose someone to do the non promotable work, they asked women 44% more than men. Um, it's, this, the study is kind of hilarious and terrible. I'm, I mean, it's a good study, but it's a horrible topic. Um, it's worth a look. Um, so we need to be deliberate, is what I'm saying. Some large percentage of your work should be the thing you're evaluated on. Like, I think not all. Um, it's good to build auxiliary skills and expand your horizons and learn new things. And it, it's only fair to do your share of taking out the garbage. But if you're doing very little of your core job, you're really hurting your career. Non-promotable work is one of those one person's trash is another person's treasure thing. You know, like if it's um, organizing an offsite, if you're an engineer, that is 100% non-promotable, not a good use of your time. Uh, if you're a manager, it's team building. You can kind of call it team building. If you're an event coordinator, then it's your core job. When there's work that is genuinely not anybody's job, it needs to be shared. And it needs to be shared deliberately and consciously. Um, because if it's just done by whoever picks it up, it won't be fair. So back to our friend. Um, people are now suggesting that she changed to a role where the work she's doing would be promotable. Now, I think it's always like this. They never say, change the work you're doing, or change how you frame your work, or change how, you, how uh, visible your work is. It's like change your role. I don't know what that is, but let's talk about changing roles. I've read a lot of articles deci about deciding when it's time to become a people manager or you know, a, a project manager or whatever. Um, and most of them focus on whether you're capable of doing it. Like they say, um, can you handle giving feedback? Do you like coaching? Do you like people? Then you should be a manager. Or can you put yourself into the shoes of your customers? Then you are a product manager. It is decided. And I think it's more like you know, signs at carnivals. Like, you must be this tall to go on the roller coaster. And you're like, I am, but no, no. I see people are screaming, people are vomiting. I don't think I would like that. I'm not going to go on the roller coaster. So when they say, you must be this socially competent to be a manager, for many of the same reasons, I'm like, no, no, thank you. That is not my idea of a good time. I have my own metric for this. If you code, you get better at coding. If you manage people, you get better at managing people. So what do you want to get better at? What are the skills you wish you had? Not what are the skills you already have. I think that's so important. I keep talking to um, female college students. And they say they don't feel like they have strong engineering skills. So they've decided not to be an engineer when they leave college. And it's like, how, where do you think the strong engineering skills would come from? You're in college. You've never been an engineer. You will get them by doing the job. So I always tell them. Don't cho choose a role that you don't want because you're scared of doing the one that you do want. I mean, if being a product manager is a thing you would love to do, then that is a good choice for you. 
though there are other considerations that I'll get to in a moment, um, but choose the thing you would love to be able to do, because the only way you will ever be able to do it is by starting to do it. Um, otherwise, it's not fair to you, and it's not fair to the role and the other people doing it. Choose a role that makes you feel successful and happy and proud, and that is teaching you skills you want to have. You'll get good at it by doing it. But the other consideration I mentioned, if you're making this decision in college or when you're junior, moving away from a more technical role is decreasing your options. It really helps to have a solid tech resume before you take a non-engineer role. Because the moment you give up an engineer title, the moment the most recent job on LinkedIn doesn't have the word engineer in it, an alarmingly high number of people will assume you don't know anything about technology. I don't know what this is. They'll assume all your existing knowledge is gone forever and you are now incapable of learning more. It is a bizarre implicit bias that a lot of engineers have, and it hurts people. And especially if your job title is any variant on project manager. Many people will just assume you're not good at technology. Um, project managers just routinely get underestimated by engineers. So um, for engineers who are here, this is my public service announcement. Please assume your TPMs can learn anything you can learn and could do your job if they chose to. This is really important. Don't be condescending to TPMs. I hope I don't have to tell anyone here, but anytime anyone gives me a stage forever, I'm just going to say this because it's awful. OK, but people do all the time. This is something I especially see happen to women and minorities, where they take a technical project manager role, they hit a ceiling, and they can't find the next role, and they're pushed towards being a non-technical project manager, a program manager. And then it's like a step out of the industry. And they're like, no, I don't want to leave tech. So they look back at where they were, the engineer job they used to have, and they also find they can't get hired at the level that they used to be at either, because of the aforementioned skills having disappeared in some way, uh, implicit bias. So they come back in at a lower level than they left. I've seen this happen too many times. They invariably hear the three most infuriating words in our industry, which are that they are not technical enough. Like, what, what is this? What is technical enough? How do you do something actionable with that? If you're ever t tempted to tell someone that they're not technical enough, I mean, first of all, don't. But um, secondly, be really specific about what you're actually trying to say. Like, um, uh, we need people on our team to participate in all of the technical discussions. Well, nobody can really participate in 100% of technical discussions. Let's say 70% of technical discussions you need to be opinionated on. Here are a list of topics. Come back able to discuss this set of topics. Like, that's OK. It's not great. It's OK. Um, or our senior engineers are all systems designers. It would be useful if you would go take a distributed systems class and come back and be able to talk about the CAP theorem. Um, that's at least actionable. But you're not technical enough? Awful. It's like saying, you know, just don't really seem like an engineer to us. I don't know. Could you seem more engineery? Uh, brings us back to our friend. So two years ago, she joined as a mid-level engineer. And since then, she spent her time filling gaps in the organization that needed to be filled to make it successful. As a result, she's been told she doesn't have enough technical accomplishments. And she would like a promotion. So let's talk about that for a second. I'm putting a lot of emphasis on um, promotion and career advancement, and it's not a priority for everyone, and that's OK. But this is, another, this is an explicit bias I have. I would like this engineer lady to feel fulfilled and also to have long-term financial security. She would like to someday retire and buy a little boat, and I would like to help her with that. So, but I don't know what her right career choice is. Only she knows that. But she should choose deliberately. She should choose based on what would she love to get better at. What is a job she'll feel happy and proud to do? And what doors is she comfortable closing, or at least making hard to reopen right now? And unfortunately, one more, which is where will she feel safe and supported? If she chooses a role that she's less excited about, but where it's just going to feel easier to go to work every day, I mean, I can't judge on that. But I hope she gets to do something that she loves. For the rest of this talk, I'm going to assume she decides to stay as an engineer, for two reasons. One is that really this is the only path I can talk about with any knowledge. But the other is that I selfishly want more senior, non-dude engineers. Uh, uh, so I, I just hope she chooses this path. But either way, I will respect her decision. Um, so right, she's decided to be a senior engineer. And honestly, she's already doing most of that job. But the problem is, at this company, she's never been a mid-level engineer. No one's ever seen her do it. And she's getting a lot of t not technical enough. So what do you do with that? What do you do if you're glue? First of all, she needs to have that career conversation that I think her manager should have initiated about 19 months ago, um, uh, she needs to ask really direct questions, like, will I get promoted next round? Or um, what work do I need to do to get promoted? Is this senior engineer work? 
do you think this is promotable work? She needs to ask the question, not um, add a whole lot of stuff after it to, to soften it or uh, take the question away, but ask the question and then stop talking with an expectant expression and let the manager answer the question. Ideally, she needs to get this in writing. If, she, if it's not coming in writing, she needs to send follow-up notes saying, I think this is what we said. I think you said I will get promoted on November 19th if I produce um, two coding projects in uh, the next whatever months. Um, and these are the two I chose. If I do this, will that get me promoted? Yes, no. Um, and she needs to check in at intervals. Don't assume that no feedback is good feedback on stuff like this. Keep asking, am I still on track? Are we still good? Secondly, job title. Now, I keep having people tell me that job titles aren't important. And these are always people to whom job titles aren't important because they don't need them. So anyone who tells you job titles don't matter have, have a, a particular privilege. And here's what it is. If you're, look, if you're, if you're a white or an Asian dude, people assume you can code. Like if you're a lawyer, people assume you can code. Um, you're, you know, you're, you're an accountant. It's like, yeah, could probably code if you tried. The rest of us don't get that for free. It's every technical conversation, you have to start by putting credentials on the table. If you have a job title that says, look, I deserve to be here. I can, I, I'm going into this conversation at a technical level that you would expect um, to have a, a good technical conversation with. Let's cut through the nonsense and get straight to the good parts. It's, it really helps. It's a lot of time you don't have to spend on explaining why you should be in the room. Titles are really important. And they bestow some freedom to do glue work without people assuming you're not technical enough anymore. If you don't need a title, this is wonderful and, and enjoy it. But try and help other people who do. Um, so what title could she get here? Could she become like the technical lead for the team? People expect a lead to do a lot of, a lot of glue. Um, like what, what else is there? Is there some... Um, uh, like oh, owner of, of this part of the organization? Is there something that they can, they can give her which gives her some, some freedom to keep doing this work while making it clearly technical work? Third, she needs artifacts of her work that show impact and tell the story. This is good advice in general, by the way. Make sure your work is visible. So like, if you have an idea, write the one-page design document, even if you're giving the idea to somebody else. Be the person who says, hey, we should do this just has to be a page. And be the person to present the idea if there's a design review or something like that. If she makes a thing happen in a meeting, a lot of these are very subtle. You know, you're in a meeting, there's an idea coming from here, an idea coming from here, and they're not meshing. And then one person manages to somehow make them fit together. She should make the meeting notes reflect that she was the person who brokered agreement here, or who brought the third idea. Um, I feel like a lot of the time we, we give the person who takes notes, we, we say that's a bad thing, being the person who takes notes. But I think taking notes is amazing. Like, why would you not want to control the history of every meeting that you've ever in? I love taking notes. Um, but send them around afterwards and make sure they're visible. She needs to own the narrative. She needs to tell this story, not in the way where she was the helper of the team, but where she's the protagonist. Due to her work and her technical judgment, this thing happened. Oops. Um, action verbs. Her manager should be telling the same story. The people she works with who admire her work should be telling the same story in the same way. Not like this person helped us, but really, this is, she is why this was successful. Now, this still might not work. Six months later, maybe the promotion people say no again. In that case, I have a solution that is a bit cynical, and I don't like recommending it, and really only use it as a last resort. If you're not getting promoted for glue work, stop doing glue work. Just stop. Uh, and it's awful, because you're going to start letting things drop and you will see them dropping, and it is not a good feeling. But if you're only gonna get promoted for the things on the job ladder, do exactly the things on the job ladder. So do some easily quantifiable technical work. Write a bunch of code. Write some designs that really anybody could have written. Learn how to performance tune the database. Um, do something that is unarguably technical. And the key is, do it even if you're not the, most, the best person on the team to do it. Even if you're gonna be slower than other people, if, even if you're kind of rusty, um, hopefully, you've, done, you've helped so many people that you've now got allies on the team who will help you get back up to speed in the way that you help them. But when you're used to being glue, it can be really hard to do this sort of thing because it won't fit around the glue work. If you're trying to do quantifiable technical work, you have to stop doing the same amount of glue work. So here's some suggestions. Stop being the lead if you're the lead, and definitely stop being the unofficial lead if you're the unofficial lead. 
Stop interviewing. Stop organizing the offsites. Stop onboarding people. Stop anything that smells at a distance like teamwork. Archive mails. Cancel meetings. Quit Slack channels. Don't catch things that are about to drop, which is about as easy as seeing like an egg drop or something and not like trying to stop it. It's like, this is going to be gross. <laughs> but let it happen. And I know it's awful, but remember, the rest of the team already does this every time. And I hate saying this, but if you're an underrepresented person in tech and you do diversity work, just for a while, stop doing diversity work. Being promoted is diversity work. You are way more useful to your mentees if you're at a higher level. You can become a sponsor. You can change the job ladder so that glue work and diversity work are um, more rewarded, or at least you've got more input into it. Um, I have three techniques for making it easier to do work that takes a lot of focus um, when you're used to being interrupt driven and having a meeting, a new meeting every half hour. Um, first, it's fake meetings. Um, you never squeeze coding time in between meetings, so make meetings in which you're doing coding. Trying harder just won't work. Um, these ones are, I, I used to have like make time and focus time and people just schedule over those. So um, I now have fake meetings that look plausible. Like uh, this is the working from work project and uh, the, um, I, I forget what the second one was, like the, the future of not getting interrupted or something like that. Um, I also hide. Um, and I mean, I don't just hide from, uh, like physically, physically hide, but I do that too, but I, um, I hide from my computer. If I've got a bunch of documents to read, um, I print them out. And uh, I leave my computer on my desk, and I go hide in a phone room and for sometimes hours. Don't tell people, oh, we're on video. Well, OK. Um, so work from home, work from meeting rooms, work from cafes. Um, just be away from where people can find you. If you're at your desk, they're used to you being interruptible, so they will walk up and interrupt. But finally, even more than other people interrupting me, the thing that interrupts me the most is my own brain, telling me that I should be doing something that is less important but more urgent, like replying to emails. And uh, so I use, do you know the Pomodoro method, the idea of setting a timer? There's an app that does sort of this um, called Forest, and I really love this. You set a time between 15 minutes and two hours, and in that time, it's going to grow a tree. There's a browser extension, and there's also a phone app. And if you use your browser for something that you haven't listed, or you use your phone for anything, in that time, it will kill the tree in front of you. It's <laughs> devastating. <laughs> this works for me really well. I recommend it. Um, so all this extra code and design reading has a side effect, which is that you get better at code and design reading. If you spend time on per performance tuning the database, turns out you're going to get better at performance tuning the database. All of this is learning. Um, if the skills you wish you have are part of the work you're doing all day, then that's really convenient because you're learning the thing you want to do while you're, while you're doing the job. But for anything you're not repeatedly doing, you have to go out and choose to learn it. Um, so even if you're getting recognized for glue work, if you think that you would like future you to have some more quantifiable technical skills than you do now, you have to make time to learn them. And I really recommend that you do that. If you only do glue, you only get better at glue. 10 years from now, you are going to be incredibly good at glue, but not any better at anything else. You're making your team more effective, but I think you are kind of hurting your future self. And no matter what you end up doing, you're unlikely to ever regret having extra core technical skills. So choose a thing you want to learn. I always tell people, you know what you want to learn, because it's the thing when people near you start talking about it, you feel really nervous, just in case they ask you a question. That's a good thing to learn. Um, but I feel like people don't talk about learning that much. In our, our industry, like um, I don't know if you follow um, Julie Evans Bork on, uh, on Twitter and her blog. She talks about learning all the time, and I think that's why her blog is so great. She she like learns something new and goes in all enthusiastic and is like, I just learned this. But most of the time, you don't see senior engineers say things like, um, I've just spent three hours trying to get my head around the difference between callbacks and promises, and I finally got it, and I'm really happy. But you know they did at some point. They just never tell you about it. Um, so for senior people, uh, for managers, for leads, I would want to say, make it really clear that you're learning and that you're learning at work. I like to put it in my calendar, like, here's a thing I don't know. At the end of two hours, I expect I will know it. And it's okay not to know it. Um, but do it during work hours. Some of us have um, the ama amazing privilege of having free time to learn. I used to, and now I have a five-year-old. And um, 
True story, I was doing a compilers class on, I think, Coursera, and uh, I was on the very last assignment and went into labor, like I was almost finished, and I was like, please don't come yet, trying to get the assignment in, but no, she was, <laughs> she was like, she was on her way. Um, but for, um, for a lot of people, they have very little free time, or some people have literally no free time. And uh, it's, it's not fair to say that they, people have to do their learning in their free time, or to imply it. Make it normal to learn at work. Encourage it. Um, and like, be kind of cool with it. Be cool with people not knowing stuff and learning stuff. Um, make a big deal of it. Turning junior people into mid-level people into senior people is way easier than hiring in this market. It's way less expensive. Why would you um, waste an opportunity to have people learn things and go up a level? Speaking of wasting learning opportunities, watch out for the ones that you're wasting by not letting people do things. Like if you're sheltering someone by always doing something for them, then you're depriving them of a learning opportunity. So if you have someone more junior than you or someone in a role that's considered less technical, ask them if they'd like to learn to do something that you do all the time. Um, stand by them as they put blocks of time in their calendar to learn it. And uh, at the end, give them a project that will exercise their skills with your support. And then you won't have to do that thing anymore because now they can do it. We only get better at what we spend time on. And that doesn't just apply to tech skills. My uh, excellent colleague, Polina, has this thing she says, when someone asks her to do more uh, humaning and communication work than is good for her, they say, but you should do this because you're so good at communication. Uh, and she is. And she says, yeah, I'm good at everything I put effort into. You should see me doing system design. And while she's off doing system design, the person who uh, was asking for her to do this for them is also going to get better at communication because they're going to have to put effort into it. It's a learning opportunity for them. So if you're a manager, I encourage you to help the non-glue people on your team put effort into communication. Remember those two dudes at the beginning who got promoted? Like our ace coder here only succeeded because someone else on the team went and got the information he needed. Um, he didn't have enough communication to send an email to another team expressing the thing he needed. Our system designer only succeeded because somebody else on the team went and found out that he was building the wrong thing. Like, he didn't have enough technical judgment to step back and ask why he was designing this thing. Are they senior engineers? Like, I'm not certain they are. And they will never learn to be if people are doing the glue for them. They will get better at what they spend time on. So glue people, push back on requests to do more than your fair share of glue. It's not helping you, but it's also not helping anybody else. Our skills aren't fixed in place. You can be good at lots of things. You can be good at anything. And that's all I have. Thank you.